words. So hello everyone and welcome to the third episode of the Learn by Doing at Home series where we bring the cafe's classroom to your home. My name is Allison Delacruz and I work in the Dean's office for the College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences. We are super excited about today's class, uh, which will focus on sausage making and grilling tips to prepare you for the upcoming Memorial Day barbecue. Now, before we get started, I'm gonna share a few housekeeping items with you, as well as introduce our instructor and share a little bit about where he is teaching today's class. So to start, we wanna go over a few Zoom tips for you. Um, for the best viewing today, you're gonna wanna select speaker view instead of gallery view. And you can do this in the top right corner of your Zoom screen. Uh, second, if you have any questions during today's class, please put them in the chat function and then we will do the, our best to answer them throughout the class. And you can find chat, the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, if you click that chat button, a window will pop up um, that you can also then minimize or close. Um, and the last housekeeping item is that we would love to see photos of you learn by doing at home. So snap a picture and share on social media. Make sure to use the hashtag learn by doing at home. Uh, and also please tag us. Um, you can do that on Instagram at CalPoly underscore cafes um, and on Facebook at CalPoly.cafes. And we'll put that in the chat for you. Um, so now to introduce our speaker, uh, today's teacher is Jim Douglas. Uh, Jim is a Cal Poly alumnus, uh, and he is the manager of our Meat Processing Center. Cal Poly's Meat Processing Center um, was 100% funded by private donations, uh, and this facility was completed in 2011. We are very proud of our Meat Processing Center, as it is the only USDA-inspected meat processing facil facility on a university campus. Jim is joined today by two Cal Poly students. Uh, these students are essential employees and have been working with Jim to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the Meat Processing Center since the beginning of Shelter in Place in March. The Meat Processing Center is critical to learn by doing and we're very grateful to Jim and his team for their continued hard work. Now, lastly, before I kick things off to Jim, we want to know a little bit about who is joining us today. So please uh, complete the following poll and share how you are affiliated to Cal Poly. Thank you so much for participating in the poll. We'll give it a couple of seconds while we let the answers roll in. Awesome. Well, it looks like the majority of the people on the call today are Cal Poly alumni, um, almost 40 uh, people. Um, we also have uh, some Cal Poly parents. Thank you so much for joining. We've got a few students, employees, Cal Poly friends. Thank you all for joining. And it looks like we also have a handful of Cal Poly donors. Thank you so much for generously supporting Cal Poly. So with that, we will... Um, Without further ado, I will kick things over to Jim and he, uh, so he can get started with the lesson. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome and uh, good afternoon to all you would-be sausage makers. I want to welcome you to our meat processing center here at Cal Poly, a name for the J and G. Lau family who were principal donors in the construction that Allison so poignantly pointed out. Uh, we're very grateful for the contribution to build such a, a facility. It's uh, designed to uh, uh, be hands-on. We have a great deal of working room here to facilitate large classes. Uh, the classes participate in all things from, from turning livestock into food. Um, we have been uh, at one point, uh, uh, as of uh, December, I had some 16 employees uh, working here at Cal Poly on a part-time basis. I am the only paid staff member here. It's, everything we do is student-driven. Uh, but then when the pandemic uh, broke out, uh, many of the students had returned home for their uh, spring break. And as we know, shelter at home policies were put into play and my workforce of 16 became six. And those were six students who had not left town and chose to dedicate themselves 
to the university and, uh, and our work here. Uh, so we commenced our, our, uh, our COVID-19 phase of life at Cal Poly with uh, myself and six students, along with my partner here, Morgan Matheny, who's a lecturer in meat science in our animal science department. And we embarked on a uh, large scale drive through uh, meat business to help facilitate the need for people to social distance themselves and still get the, the groceries and quality meats that they uh, were accustomed to purchasing here. I since have been able to add three more students who were living in town and had not left the area. So we're, we're up to nine students, myself and Morgan. And uh, we've um, turned out we've been playing a very vital role in our community and in providing uh, uh, quality meat products in our drive through pickup service. Um, and in the process, we've learned an awful lot about hygiene beyond what we thought was just food spoilage pathogens. It's become uh, um, <laughs> a pathogen of much greater concern in, in COVID. And so we've been working diligently with distancing and PPE and, and uh, we serve our, our customers with, uh, with uh, the young folks are in masks and gloves and protecting our customers from any, any risk. Um, but the facility, the students here uh, in this facility are learning about animal harvesting, uh, meat fabrication, further processing of things like sausage products, hams, bacons, jerky, and so forth. They're learning about uh, pathogen control and sales and marketing, and uh, a great deal of time is spent on food safety. Being under USDA inspection, we do engage with the USDA on a daily basis, and there's a, a great deal of food safety to, in, at play here. Uh, but uh, truly a privilege to be here at Cal Poly after so many years in the industry, uh, working uh, with the students and, and kind of circling life back to uh, uh, a really great place to be. And uh, I'm grateful for to Cal Poly and the donors who uh, gave us the MPC. Um, an acronym we'll throw around a lot tonight. Uh, but I'd like to uh, introduce uh, a couple key players in all this. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll say first, Colton Naylor. He's uh, become a, a very important part of our uh, processing team here. He's an award-winning sausage maker collegiately. And uh, grateful to have his passion and, and interest in what we do. And secondly will be uh, Haley Olson. She has uh, been the face of this drive up business, although behind a mask. Her and her teammate, Jamie Thompson, have served most every vehicle that's driven through here and they number in some 100 cars per day. It's really a big deal. And uh, so she's been the girl behind the mask. Uh, so I'm gonna pass the microphone over to each of them for a, a brief uh, comment before we, we move on. And first, uh, Colton Naylor, step on up. Hi, everyone. My name is Colton Naylor. I am a third year animal science student, and this is my second year working at the Cal Poly Meat Processing Center. And uh, really briefly, Jim asked me to talk um, about a little bit about the learn by doing experiences that we have here at Cal Poly. And uh, one of the experiences that I have found um, the most um, valuable in my experience is going to different processing facilities across California and visiting those, as well as being invited to the Tyson Food Company in Chicago to experience some of their um, research and development teams, uh, their food products, as well as a lot of their food handling and safety, safety skills that they do on a massive production to feed the entire US and all other countries around. Next up is Haley Olson. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Haley Olson. I'm a third year ag science student here at Cal Poly. Um, I've been working at the Meat Processing Center for about a year and a half and have gotten the chance to experience a variety of things um, since I started working here. Um, and the shift to our new retail system has been a crazy experience, but it's been amazing to be able to see how many people we are able to support throughout the community and how many people support us. And the uh, Learn By Doing experience that I've had here at Cal Poly have just been the various enterprises I've had the chance um, to take throughout my years here. 
Um, it's been a great experience and I am looking forward to getting back to more of those in the future. Thank you for joining us. See how blessed I am? I am a lucky man to be surrounded by students like these two. Um, well, that uh, concludes my, uh, my introduction. Um, I like to uh, get into uh, a discussion now about making sausage, which is just about the funnest thing I think. Uh, we, uh, when making, uh, oh, I, I guess I should tell a story about what we're making tonight. We're gonna make an apple pork sausage. And apple pork sausage is, has a rich tradition. And actually, I, I'm gonna dare say that San Luis Obispo is its birthplace. Uh, its creator was Norm Hagen, a former Cal Poly lecturer and uh, entrepreneur here locally. He, uh, many of you alumni will remember him for his uh, endeavors here at Cal Poly and his local business, Old Country Deli. I spent 20 years working with Norm and uh, uh, it was a valuable experience. But one of his first big uh, trademark sausages was, was uh, apple pork sausage. My apple pork sausage made to include applesauce. And, uh, it, uh, it was a cornerstone of, of the business in the beginning until our product line grew to include many more tasty sausages. Uh, so uh, shout out to the Egan family and, uh, and Norm and, and his, uh, his leadership and mentorship to so many. Um, <clears throat> in making uh, the apple pork sausage, there are uh, a number of uh, things we, we could talk about when we look at sourcing ingredients for making any pork sausage, going to the local market to find things to make sausage can always be a challenge. Uh, we have uh, on, on display tonight, the most common ingredient would be at the Boston butt. Uh, it has an excellent ratio of fat to lean and it, it by itself is a great standalone raw material. Fat content is very important to sausage making. Uh, recommend a 15 to 20 percent fat content and Boston Boston butts are, are, are just about that uh, on a regular basis now sometimes you go to a leaner cut of pork and that's all you could find you, you need to try to find something to fatten it up and that's always a challenge we get phone calls people looking for pork fat to make sausage um, they will often uh, be making the game sausage which be very lean and so the, the need to uh, find some pork fat because the, the, the juiciness and textures in the fat, uh, the proteins and the nutrition, or the nutrition's in the protein, but you got to have fat for, for juice, juiciness and texture. Um, I've listed also some other things like pork cushion meat, also known as pork tri-tip, a leaner cut, uh, used best with a tap source. Uh, I've uh, also demonstrated fresh pork side which is a pork belly, uncured. Sometimes you'll find it in the marketplace and it could be as much as 50% fat. It could be helped add to the blend and help make a juicy uh, pork sausage. Um, sometimes boneless country style spare ribs uh, can make for uh, make a piece of the puzzle uh, work for you because it'll have a higher fat content and, and lend some juiciness. Um, also talked about pork picnic roast. Um, and uh, pork leg roast. These are things that you may find in, in your local markets that make uh, for uh, good pork sausage making. Uh, but again, uh, don't forget about fat content. A uh, lean sausage will be very mealy and the texture is not that enjoyable. Uh, and we uh, I provided you uh, folks with the, the recipe for the sausage tonight for you to enjoy. I've included a couple of forms of, of measurement, uh, pounds and ounces, um, oftentimes require a home scale to measure. I also included a volume measurement, which would be cups, uh, teaspoons and tablespoons that could uh, help you uh, formulate a, a sausage blend at home. Um, then we're going to get into the step-by-step -step process the flow chart, if you will, which we're, we're providing, which uh, I hope will help uh, m make the you know, you know, your experience at home simple and easy to follow and understand. Um, 
there's uh, some things you always want to do before you embark on making sausage <clears throat> is to prepare those things you can in advance so that when you start your making your sausage making process you can move swiftly and efficiently because temperature control is is very critical in food safety and also it plays a role in protecting the integrity of, of your sausage. Uh, you imagine a warm fat going to the grinder. Its integrity is will be severely compromised. Um, I've uh, displayed here tonight out in, in front of us uh, some examples of, of, the, of the process uh, in our Zoom environment. It, we weren't able to perform this interactively, so we're going to have to uh, just do some uh, phasing it on display. Uh, but in preparation, we talk about cubing and chilling the pork. You're gonna, you wanna uh, chill the pork in cubes that will be required to facilitate your grinding mechanism that you have. I have uh, a grinder on display tonight, a nice home style grinder, uh, it's a half horsepower motor, and if I dare, borrow a line from Tim Allen, more power. It's always about more power when choosing a home grinder. Uh, so go as big as you can afford. Uh, but so we, we have a grinder. And by the way, these grinders are also come with a stuffing horn that you're capable of actually stuffing your link sausage with your grinder. Now, Colton and I, we prefer an independent stuffer. Then it's much more efficient and more expedient in, in its use. and uh, the grinder can be uh, rather slow and, and uh, kind of beats up your sausage going through that grinding system again. But uh, we also can use KitchenAid's real proper uh, home appliance that comes with all kinds of good sausage making tools, all for grinding and stuffing uh, sausage products. So we've cubed up pork, put the cubed pork in the fr into the freezer, into the fridge, and keep it cold or freezer to keep it even cold. Recommend it. 40, uh, less than 40 degrees during the, the onset of your process. Uh, so then we go from the, uh, we're gonna run the pork sausage through the grinder the first time through a very coarse plate. This plate has three eighths inch hole diameter in its uh, die. And we're gonna do a very coarse grind of the pork. And you don't wanna hit the pork with a small fine grind, right? from whole muscle because it, it, it causes too much temperature rise and it's, it's, it's hard on the, on the protein and fat structures. So we start with a, a coarse grind. <clears throat> and then we have, uh, we go through the coarse grind and we introduce now the mixing in of, of our, our ingredients, uh, things like uh, nutmeg and cinnamon and applesauce. They're all introduced into this coarse blend <clears throat> where once you first you begin by scrambling it around so you get good surface contact with all the ingredients and then as as you then you introduce the applesauce and then things start to really move around and the more you mix it the more it gets sticky and then you're, you're going to start working that sausage into a, a nice emulsion of protein and fat and applesauce and spices are all working together and uh, so you do this, but you start by scrambling around in the bowl so you get good surface area contact with everything. Then you introduce the applesauce and it begins to get more and more sticky. And once you're satisfied that all the ingredients have been absorbed, you got some stickiness to the sausage, it's time to go through the grinder once more. Now, this, this can be done with one grind. Grinding twice is, is, is a bit of a, a preference. It's an artisanship thing. Um, but it's one I believe in, and then so now then we go to another grinder plate, uh, three sixteenths inch diameter holes, and now we're going to run the sausage through there. We get our final texture. The the sausage becomes much more uh, creamy and 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 fluid, and everything's melding together, and uh, it's really it really takes a, takes shape uh, at going through that second time. It takes a bit of it's a bit of a process. It's slower. You feed a grinder slower. Um, so now by this time, you probably have experienced a temperature rise that certainly is going to exceed 40 degrees. 
through time and friction and elements, uh, it, it's natural that the temperature will rise. So it's not, you know, it, you're not talking about it could get up 45, 50 degrees, not your typical food sto storage uh, conditions. The key is time. Pathogens work on temperature and time. So we're not going to give them the time to take advantage of the high temperature. So at any point in the process, you get bogged down, things slow, there's distractions. You want to take whatever step you're at and get it back into the fridge, back into the freezer, and allow it to, to chill back down. Uh, and honestly, you have three to five hours before pathogen uh, multiplication really becomes an issue. So uh, rest assured that temperature rise is normal, but not something to, to take for granted and, and allow to uh, continue. Um, <clears throat> so then we've gone through our, our final need and grind, and now we get the stuff and link. And stuffing and, and linking is generally when the party starts. Um, if we were making uh, our Swiss sausage here this evening, We'd have some of Benoit's great red wine from the Cal Poly Winery going into the sausage with some beef and pork and garlic and spices. And uh, I know home sausage makers tend to uh, do a little quality assurance to check on that wine from time to time. And uh, I recommend it. Uh, but no wine tonight. Our, uh, our poison tonight is applesauce. Um, so uh, we've. Uh, we're getting to the stuffing phase now. Now we get into talking a little bit more about sourcing materials. And uh, one of the great challenges is uh, in the community is finding the sausage casing. Uh, in our case, we're using natural, natural pork casings. And we buy buckets and buckets of casings that come on a tube, as it's known. And you, you, you prepare these and you slide them right onto your stuffing horn, your stuffing tube. It's very expedient, very nice. They used to come in a big, big bag and they're all tangled in knots. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, in, in preparation, they come packed in salt and you want to soak them, you want to flush them in cool water, get, you know, rid, them, rid it of salt, and then soak them in warm water to make them soft and pliable. And this can even be done the day prior and then store them in the fridge overnight. And, uh, but the, the water being slightly tepid, uh, helps with the, uh, the stuffing process and helps it uh, move smoothly over, smoothly over the stuffing horn. Uh, finding sausage casings, um, is, it, is it's not as hard as it used to be. Uh, we can sell sausage casings here. Uh, Colton has purchased sausage casings at Whole Foods. Uh, they make sausage in their butcher shop and uh, they'll sell sausage casings. And uh, there's a number of online sources as well. Uh, I bought this stuffer from the Waltons uh, Meat Processing Company, Waltons. It's, uh, they've got a great uh, website and equipment, seasonings and uh, casing purchases that he had, great catalog. And then I bought my grinder from the LEM Company, L-E-M, uh, very reputable home grinding uh, system maker. And they also have a complete catalog of, of uh, ingredients and, and products. So there's online sources today like never before. But for, uh, for all of us here locally, uh, Cal Poly Meats, uh, Whole Foods, to name a few, uh, and a lot of the local butcher shops will offer them for sale. I can't uh, hear it. Um, Jim, we've got a couple of questions, if you don't mind answering a few. Uh, yeah, please. Okay, um, so someone wants to know, uh, is the applesauce you use sweetened or unsweetened? Uh, thank you. Uh, we use unsweetened, and then we choose our own. And by using unsweetened applesauce, you have control of what kind of sweetener you want to introduce to your sausage. Uh, sugar or a sweetener of some kind is very common in sausage products to help take the bitterness out of the salt ingredient, which is which is very necessary. And uh, so we choose to use unsweetened. We get that way we get away from things like high fructose corn syrup, to name a few. Uh, and then we're, in our business, you're, you're, we're all label readers, right? And to, lay, to read a label on our sausage product, it merely says unsweetened applesauce made with apples. It reads a lot better than 
a lot of different sweeteners added. So we choose to add our own sugar. Now you can use sweetened applesauce, you just have to reduce your, your sugar content by about one third. Great. And then can you talk about what other kinds of meat you can use in making sausage? Ooh, sorry, such as chicken? <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, the chicken is, is a great uh, source for sausage materials. I prefer it much more than turkey. Um, it uh, tends to uh, be a little higher in fat content, so it has better mouthfeel, better texture, more juiciness. And with, and I would then again recommend turkey thigh meat over breast meat. I tried to introduce breast meat before, and it, it tends to be much too dry. Uh, chicken thigh meat is, is a great uh, material, and uh, and because chicken poultry tends to be a bit more tender at the onset than than pork or beef, uh, we do only grind it once typically. We'll grind chicken through a, a three six medium plate, introduce our ingredients, and go straight to the stuffer. Just because the the, the muscle structure is not as tight and tough as as beef and pork. It requires a bit more mastication, if you will. Okay, great. And then we got another question. Um, if, if someone isn't able to source casings or they don't want to use them, do you have any recommendations on how to make sausage without them? Absolutely. You can uh, use these um, uh, same stuffing apparatuses, KitchenAid, grinders, stuffers, uh, to uh, uh, exude that is just stuff the sausage out into a long stream onto a, a tray with parchment paper and you place that in a freezer and and chill it you can actually make a skinless sausage when you do that though you do tend to want to make it mix it very well so it gets very sticky and holds together but you can make a skinless link without the casing uh, an apple sausage product tends to be a bit loose and could be a challenge with, uh, with all that added moisture. Um, but that's uh, certainly an option. Of course, making patty sausage is, 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 is a given. Uh, but there, uh, there are options for, for going skinless in a very simple homemade way. Okay, great. And then the last question I've got for you on this uh, for now is, how do you know the fat content of the pork? Is it on the package? Um, and then when do you add more fat? Um, you're not going to find it on the package. Um, that's where you, you look at uh, presentations like tonight's with some of our sourcing ideas. Um, of course, the meat counter uh, would be a great source of help, too, in, in most all the markets. Uh, ask your butcher uh, to help guide you with what they have available at the counter to, to make, make your job uh, pay off. Um, but again, uh, you know, you tell me you're looking for something 15 to 20 percent fat. The only pork butts are, are just made in heaven for sausage. They just come together, come perfectly put together. Uh, after that, you do get creative. But I think your butcher is the best source of information, given what's on what's available. Okay, great. That's all the questions we have now. Um, all right. Um, so uh, we've got uh, a nice display here of, 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 of pork apple sausage now, or apple pork sausage. Um, this is an, again in a natural hog casing. It's been stuffed in a presentation that would be typical for grilling. It's also a pretty excellent sausage in a small diameter presentation that you would normally get with a, uh, with a sheep casing, a small diameter sheep casing. Uh, this is like 32 millimeter sheep casing. It's like 22 millimeter. So it's a breakfast link, uh, like you see in the market. Uh, although like Farmer John is a skinless link, this, that's kind of the process, kind of item I talked about previously. Uh, to emulate Farmer John, you could uh, make a skinless link. But anyway, this is kind of a, a dimension typically for grilling. Uh, you, make a, you can use this, but what I'm going to tell you about is making pigs in a blanket with this sausage. So ideally, a small diameter sausage, par cooked, bake it in the oven till done, 160 degrees, and wrap it in a crescent roll triangle and bake it for another 15 minutes. It is the most sinful thing on earth. It is so delicious. 
you can do it with a large diameter sausage, pretty hefty portion. But this product, it has a pig in a blanket, can't beat it. But we use it a lot here in the Central Coast for appetizers. Uh, pretty tasty on a bun with some mustard. Uh, <clears throat> so that's uh, that's apple sausage. Uh, now we we talked about materials that make sausage out of um, so much uh, of where we all started with this is with with wild game and and farm animals things you had available to you and so that they're not all perfect pork butts. Um, the um, uh, venison is a very and wild pork is often used on on the coast here and when you get involved in making game sausage I caution you about the intensity of of the flavors of game an apple pork sausage tends to be a bit mild and sweet and if your game is carrying is a little hefty in flavor I may suggest a more robust sausage something that brings a, a lot of a lot of spice, a lot of garlic, and a lot of red wine. Um, but uh, I've had wild game, wild uh, wild uh, pig, uh, apple pork sausage before, and it's it's wonderful and if it's the right kind of animal. Um, so uh, let me see. Uh, I think I'm ready to transition to uh, a little chit chat about grilling. Okay, great. Um, so while Jim gets set up uh, for his grilling demonstration, um, we are gonna uh, do another poll question and get you guys involved. Um, so if you could answer the following poll question and share what kind of meat are you planning on, um, on eating this Memorial Day weekend? Thank you for participating. We'll give it a couple of seconds while answers flood in. I love seeing all the tri-tip. It's a Central Coast favorite, as I'm sure many of you know. Awesome, looks like we almost have everyone that's uh, participated in the poll. So the, the winner looks like it's actually sausage, which, uh, Hopefully you guys learned some tips that can you can make some good Memorial Day weekend sausage. Also tri-tip, which is perfect. We are gonna talk about tri-tip here in a second once they finish getting set up. Also burgers and veggies and some chicken. So great. Thank you so much for participating in that poll. Looks like they are getting close to being set up. Okay. All right, Jim, do you need another few seconds or are you good? No, I'm ready. I'm ready. All Thank right. You. Now on to grilling tips. Okay. Um, so something to, we want to talk about uh, getting ready for this weekend is, uh, you know, choosing the, the best cut of meat for your party. Uh, we have uh, on the screen here tonight some lovely Cal Poly lamb chops, uh, fantastic lamb. Didn't win the poll tonight, but thank God tri-tip is in the running. We got tri-tip for you tonight. Uh, we're looking at uh, meat quality. I mean, we, we know the standards in terms of meat grading and quality. We talked about prime beef, choice beef. Then there's another grade called select which uh, doesn't uh, quite meet the standards for marbling. And, and meat quality, first the most important thing is always the age of the animal. Right? It has to be a young animal to meet the highest standards. Uh, a young animal is gonna be something under 24 months of age, most certainly. Uh, so with, with that age, comes the first step in, in, in tenderness and, and nice color. Uh, then with feeding an animal, whether it's, it's pork, lamb, or beef, it comes down to, starts with genetics and a good feed ration, and all these things play into uh, a beef 
or pork animal performing well on the rail, as we put it. And that's where we, we, we put them, we, we process this animal, and we're looking for, the, for a grade. And we're going to cross-section them at the ribeye, and we're going to evaluate uh, beef and, and perhaps soon pork. Pork is, is uh, there's been discussion about it, uh, having the quality grades that, that more similar to beef. Um, we're looking for marbling. Marbling is intramuscular fat. It's one of the last places an animal puts fat on. So it's why it takes time and, and energy to, to reach this point of high quality. Uh, but with that marbling uh, comes your juiciness. It's not water, it's not marinades, it's, it's the fat and the marbling that's in that muscle. Now, you can compensate a little bit for a lesser marbling score with aging. You could take a USDA select cut of meat and with the right amount of uh, post-harvest aging, it can become tender. You can't make up for juiciness, but you can help make it more tender. Uh, on the subject of, um, of aging, now in the beginning, the meat industry, you know, practiced dry aging exclusively. And that was because the advent of vacuum packaging and, and uh, large scale production had not evolved to the point it's at today. And so with dry aging, it's, a, it's an anaerobic or an aerobic process. There's oxygen involved. The meat, the carcass is hanging in the cooler exposed to oxygen and, and those environs. And with that sets the stage for very specific enzymes and microbes and molds, honestly, believe it, molds, very, very uh, beneficial molds, will work to tenderize and develop the flavor that we've grown to, to love in a beef product. Uh, now, mind you, pork doesn't age like beef, so you, you don't talk too much about aging pork. Uh, lamb, maybe just a little bit. But with the subject of beef, so dry aging, um, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's fantastic, but it commercially has some problems. Uh, you experience high yield, uh, high shrinkage, yield loss. Lots of dollars uh, uh, go up the, the, the evaporative coolers um, in terms of dehydration. And, and, you know, in the economy of scale, that can add up to a great deal of expense. Uh, and then you do have certain shelf life concerns with all that, uh, all the, the microbes and the molds and things I was talking about that play a part in dry aging meat. Uh, and it's, it's, it's much less predictable. So then comes the, the advent of large scale meat production and vacuum packaging. And then now today we engage in an awful lot of wet aging. Wet aging is when that meat is cut fresh and in most cases becomes boneless and goes into a vacuum package and is stored in coolers. And, and when I say stored, a, a very high-end steakhouse will have stored their wet aged meat for as much as three months, going on four months. You can get that kind of shelf life given that all the hygienic uh, standards were in play along the way and there's no harmful uh, uh, bacteria interfering with the process. But wet aging, so what happens in, 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 in within 48 hours, it's in the box, it's in the cooler, it's in the truck, and it's in someone else's cooler. And so things are moving very quickly and it gives them the mobility, the process of the mobility to do that. So, uh, and then there's no shrinkage, there's no yield loss. So they, the economy uh, and scale uh, plays into wet aging quite well. But you still can have a great tender, delicious piece of meat through the process, but being anaerobic in a vacuum package, it's gonna select for different microbes, different enzymes, there'll be no mold. And so different things will work on the flavor development and work to help tenderize and break down some of those connective tissues and, and proteins. Uh, so uh, again, aging is the great equalizer, uh, but marbling will always be juicy, juiciness. Aging will most generally always be your, your tenderness. Um, now you can't go backwards. Uh, people, I hear people do this and I'm surprised to think that they, 
this is a, they're successful at it. Once you go anaerobic, that is going through a vacuum package, you can't open up the package and put it on a plate in the fridge. Uh, things are different. All the selections have been made and they don't work in the reverse. Um, a dry aged piece of meat most probably would age okay in a, in a going anaerobic, but you just can't go backwards. So uh, I don't recommend trying dry aging meat once it's been vacuum packaged and in the uh, food chain for a number of weeks already. Um, so that's a little bit about meat selection. Love lamb, love pork, they all love marbling. Um, <clears throat> so tonight I've got a couple of samples uh, I brought out here tonight. I've got some really nice rib, a ribeye, you know, New York, bony New York steak from some Cal Poly cattle we're processing now. Beautiful, high choice meat. Uh, be a fantastic meal on a barbecue this weekend. Uh, we've got a, a tri-tip. Uh, again, a, a Cal Poly born and raised cut of meat. Uh, nicely seasoned in our, our, our own Cal Poly rub. And we have another variation of it. We call it rancher's rub, something more traditional on the Samaria seasoning line. Uh, so when it comes to seasoning meat, something that's really important uh, is to understand uh, your portion, how you're going to serve it. Now, with San Marino style cooking, you're going to cook a, a, a whole portion like a tri-tip. And when you go to cut it and serve it, imagine the, the amount of surface area on that slice of meat. That's the amount of surface area. That surface area is what's carrying your spice and your salt. And so you tend to want to heavily season a whole muscle item for San Marino style cooking because the surface area it's going to be small and you want to enjoy the flavor of your, of your seasonings. In the case of a steak, now imagine a steak, a bite could be half to, half to half three quarter inches in diameter and that would represent a great deal of surface area. And so if you over season a steak, you're going to have the impact of the spice and the salt much more than you would Santa Maria style cooking. So you would uh, season a steak uh, type of cut um, much more moderately than you would set to style cooking for a uh, whole muscle. Um, and uh, you know, the seasonings come in all shapes and sizes, but uh, we, uh, we're pretty proud of the two we offer here. Uh, they've been around uh, town for a long time, these concepts. Uh, now when it comes to cutting tri-tip, or let me say about cooking tri-tip, um, I really am a believer, regardless of time at the grill, to use a good meat thermometer. Meat thermometers don't lie. And with the meat thermometer, the worst trouble you can get in is you don't make your spouse's cooking deadline. But you will serve a quality cut of, of, of meat if you trust your thermometer. And uh, I, I have a few uh, guidelines here. This may have made a good PowerPoint. But when cooking beef, for instance, uh, I look at a, a rare, rare cut of beef being cooked to 125 degrees and then allowing to rest. They will continue to rise in temperature and equalize and help and then retain its juices. Uh, medium rare, 130 degrees internal, let it rest. Medium, 135 degrees, let it rest. Uh, well done, 145 or 140 degrees and above with rest because it does continue to cook. And again, if you allow it to rest, when you go to carve, you'll see a lot less juice coming out on your cutting board and the, the meat will retain those juices. Uh, ground beef, always 160. Ground beef has been ground up. All that surface area has been exposed to possible uh, food spoilage organisms and you have to cook it uh, to 160 degrees or more. Uh, the reason you can cook a steak less is because the internal mechanism of that cut is basically pure it's never been cut it's never been poked it's never been exposed and and so the surface area of a steak is getting grilled any food uh, pathogen risk are getting uh, uh, destroyed by the the grill on, the, on that open surface uh, chicken always 165 rare chicken medium rare chicken just is not it's kind of repulsive and uh and uh chicken uh you know, you need to protect yourself from risk of uh, salmonella. Um, and then pork, pork always controversial. 
in the old days, it was cooked pork until it, uh, uh, you know, it, it incinerated. And because the old days we had trichinosis and well, trichinosis hasn't been around in a long time. The National Pork Council has worked hard to try to change the cooking standards for pork. The USDA has pushed back. Um, many people eat a nice medium rare pork chop today with confidence, but uh, still a, a controversy at play. Um, and then anyway, so we get on to carving. Um, with with tri-tip and, and most any form of animal protein, you want to cut across the grain. If you cut with the grain, you'll have long stringy pieces of, of meat. So you cut across the grain, makes it more tender, more easy to chew. And with a with a tri-tip, now this is this is hard to see, no doubt at home, but you, you, you lay the tri-tip on, on the side opposite the fat, and you'll see the grain of how the grains of the meat run. And you can then take, and you could perhaps start carving at this point, across the grain, make nice thinner slices. The fellow I worked for, the caterer, Norm Egan, we used to like to cut them in half first, so we didn't have big slabs of meat. And then we would then still cut across the grain, make nice dinner cut wedges. Colton, you did a magnificent job on that tri-tip. 125 and let it rest. <clears throat> and uh, folks, you can see what the three of us are having for dinner when we hang up here tonight. Beautiful job. <clears throat> um, and we have a couple of questions. If that's I okay. need questions. All right. Um, so, uh, do you have any recommendations on a good meat thermometer brand? I like a I like a thermometer that you can that you can calibrate. And that's a great question. Um, you know, we're, we're using we of course today we use a lot of electronic thermometers, and, and and there's a lot of great products in all the cooking shows. Um, the old-fashioned dial thermometer, uh, you can actually calibrate and adjust it if, if, it, if uh, it falls out of uh, its proper setting. And let me just say a little something about calibrating it. An old dial thermometer like this is that you can submerge it in 212 degree boiling water, swirl it around, you want the dial to hit 212, and it actually has a little nut on the bottom, and you turn the dial face to set it to 212 degrees and you've calibrated a thermometer that you can rely on. Um, I don't know that there's any one brand anymore for, for thermometers, and most will be electronic, um, but you may not be able to calibrate it at home, but you can always check it in, in, in boiling water for accuracy. Okay, great. And how long should you let your meat rest? Uh, depending on the, on the dimension, uh, for a, a, a modest uh, tri-tip or a, a nice thick ribeye, I would allow it to rest, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. If, if, the, if the environment is cool, you could perhaps put a piece of foil over it, um, but uh, not, don't wrap it tightly because it will then overcook. Now, a large top block, something with a lot of mass, uh, you could allow it to, to rest uh, 20 minutes and above. Another question we got is, do you ever reverse sear your tri-tip? <clears throat> uh, I, I don't. I, I came from the school of thought, and, and it was a very simple little nursery rhyme that we practiced. It was sizzle, turn, sizzle, turn. And so when cooking, particularly over, over a grill, whenever the meat would crackle, we would turn it, never allowing it to, to char and have a thickened uh, crust on it. Um, can I support that with a lot of science? I don't think so. But um, the idea of sealing in juices uh, can be compensated by allowing the meat just to rest before you carve it. Uh, and I think the results are as good. Uh, and so char then becomes a preference. Okay. Um, if you grind your own meat and grill right away, uh, can you grill at a lower temperature, say at 135? Uh, for food safety? <laughs> Is, would that be the idea? I'm assuming that's a food safety concern. Um, and uh, I, uh, I 
wouldn't recommend it. Okay. Let's see if we got any other questions. Um, someone asked, uh, they've heard that if you let your steak sit at room temperature before grilling, uh, that it helps the muscle relax. Is that true or false? Um, I'm going to say true and false in that allowing your meat to come to room temperature before you cook it. I'm not familiar with the relaxed muscle tech uh, thought on that, but I am familiar with allowing it to warm a bit reduces the time on the grill. So it, it takes a lot less of, uh, time and temperature, to, uh, you know, which is basically, you know, kind of abusing that piece of meat. It reduces that amount of time. And I think you'll, you'll have a, a much juicier cut in, in the end for allowing it to warm a bit. I wouldn't do that with chicken. <laughs> yeah. And what's your preference when you're uh, grilling at home? Do you use a, a gas grill, charcoal, Traeger? Um, <clears throat> well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Um, I, have, I have two, two at home. I have a, a, a Traeger and I have a, a wood fired grill. Um, I am just not a big fan of gas grills. Uh, suppose you can put some wood chips in there and they have some technology to help bring some flavor, but I, I've never cared for the, the sterile flavor of a, a gas fired uh, uh, meat product, uh, gas grill meat product. Uh, I, like, I like Traeger, because they bring some of those natural wood characteristics with the convenience of, of a gas grill. Flip a switch, warm it up, cook. Can't beat that on a Tuesday night. But I like my oak fired wood grill. Um, barbecuing is, is not just a means to fill my belly, but it's, it's an event and it's something that I just enjoy doing. So building the fire, and, and cooking all over a good oak fire is, for me, the ultimate uh, enjoyment. Great. And the last question we have here, and I think it's a very important question. Um, you should know that this question comes from Dr. Jamie Noland. No. She, uh, she wants you to know, uh, wants to know, do you think the Giants will win the World Series? <laughs> <laughs> Does she think they'll be a World Series? <laughs> <laughs> well, the answer is yes, <laughs> of course. That's all the questions we have. Is there uh, any last minute things you, you want to share? Um, you know, uh, for those of you that live within 100 miles, come and see us. You'll, you'll love this guy, these guys. I've got seven more just like the two you met tonight. And uh, we get, you know, prior to our social distancing, our customer base wasn't just based on meat quality and quality of service, it was based on coming in to visit with Cal Poly students. Alumni, senior citizens, everybody comes in and loves to engage with the students. Uh, and so I invite everybody to come to the Meat Processing Center. When you can, when we all can get together, have a tour and, uh, and look at our, our meat market. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jim. We really appreciate it. This was a really fun class. Um, I'm going to wrap up with just some closing remarks. Um, as Jim talked about, our meat processing center is open right now for curbside pickup. Um, and our team is working hard to feed San Luis Obispo County. So some products you can find at, Cal at the Cal Poly Meat Store include sausage, of course. Uh, we have a variety of steak cuts, bacon, chicken, pork, you name it. Um, we also have Cal Poly eggs, cheese, chocolates, jams, and barbecue sauces. We also recently started selling produce boxes full of fruits and veggies uh, that come from our campus farm. So you can find some more, more information about um, the Cal Poly Meat Store and a full list of products um, at calpolymeats.com. We will put that link in the chat for you. Um, if we weren't able to answer your question today, please reach out to Jim via email. We'll, we will add his email to the chat and also post it on the website. And please do not forget to share photos of you learn by doing at home. We would love to see what uh, meats you grill up this weekend during Memorial Day weekend. Um, if you want to rewatch today's lesson or forward it to a friend, um, we will post the recording um, at cafes.calpoly.edu 
We'll also put that link in the chat for you. And last but not least, next week is our final Learn By Doing at Home episode. So please tune in Wednesday, May 27th from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, we will be teaching you how to make some delicious Indian street food. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much for joining us today and happy grilling. <laughs>